I have a very important question to ask you. Have you checked out the Generally Spooky Patreon yet? Because if not, why not? We've got oodles of content over there, exclusive episodes only available on Patreon, our wee blethers, the chatty, unscripted weekly show where Kieran and I discuss episodes, what's going on with us, and generally have a great time. There's also the Spooky Book Club, where you'll get a chapter a week of a spooky classic. At the moment, we're in the middle of The Turn of the Screw by Henry James, and I am dying to know how it ends. As well as all that goodness, joining our Patreon is really what keeps the podcast going. It allows us to keep doing what we love, which is chatting to all of you about spooky Scottish history. You're £75 a month. No, I'm just kidding. You can pay 4 8 or £12 a month to keep the lights on and keep the creepy cogs turning. So come join in. Search Generally Spooky Patreon or click on the link in our description. We have some very exciting news. We've partnered with the National Trust for Scotland. Joining the Trust with one of their memberships helps to preserve and protect the many amazing historical and significant sites across Scotland for future generations. Your membership gets you free access to all 500 National Trust locations across the country, as well as free parking. And who doesn't love free parking? A National Trust for Scotland membership is ideal for days out with the family or for saving money on that tour across Scotland that you're taking for your holidays to see all the generally spooky sites like Culloden Battlefield, Culloden Castle and Glencoe National Nature Reserve. Use the link in our description to get your trust membership and you'll be preserving Scotland's history as well as supporting us here at the podcast. Thank you and happy travels. Start recording and I'm drooling everywhere. The episode just tastes that good. <laughs> get some of that tasty content. Get our episode in your mouth. Mm, is that better or worse than from our mouths to your ears? Better. Oh, you think it's better? Unhesitatingly. Better. <laughs> is it because you said it? Yeah. I disagree. You would. You're wrong. <laughs> welcome to the Generally Spooky Podcast. Welcome, welcome. Here we are again, back for the penultimate episode. I know. I'm quite sad. I always get sad at the end of the season. I know. I know. It's always sad to be ending. But it's been a lot of work, so I'm kind of happy to have a break once it's finished. <laughs> yeah. Considering I just picked up my coffee and then blew in my microphone a you second did. ago. You did. Unfortunately, it wasn't recording because that could have been really funny to yeah. just put in here. <laughs> I mean, I could do it. It kind of sounded like... That's what it sounded like. That was a recreation. That, wait, what am I doing? <laughs> it's not even like especially early or especially late. It's, it's the afternoon. It's just, it's just, it's just not awake yet. <laughs> when you haven't had your coffee but need your coffee to drink your coffee. Well, Kieran's the one who blew into the microphone. Yes, I'm Kieran. Hello, hello. I'm Ailey. I didn't, do, or I guess I did do that, didn't I? Ha <laughs> <laughs> Shit. <laughs> and we're here to tell you all about Scottish history, myths and legends and spooky stories. Yes. Ailey is telling me a story for the first time. I get to listen just like you, which is exciting. And we have a very special announcement. We do. We do, we do, we do. We've been excited to, to share it with you for like a week. I know, I know. Because it was Maddox's eighth birthday. Yes, it was. Happy birthday, Maddox. Happy birthday, Maddox. You listen. You, we love you lots. I hope you had a great day. I hope you had a spooky birthday. Being eight is so much better than being seven. It's true. You know, it just is. It just is. It just is. So happy birthday, bud. Happy birthday. I hope it was good. Have a whiskey on us. <laughs> but ask your mum first. On the house. <laughs> we also have news that it's now or never for your spooky merch. Yes. Not you, Maddox, specifically. You, no, no, like, it's it's not just at you. No. You just enjoy your birthday. Yes. Listeners, it is your last chance to get spooky merch because it is on sale until Halloween. Yes. So this episode will be reaching most of you on the 28th, but Halloween merch will not be in the shop after Halloween. So you have until Halloween to get our really cool pumpkin designs. Mm -hmm. um, we have our jack-o'-lantern. We have a turnipple lantern which I love. I love it too. We also have tote bags with those designs on. We've got hoodies and sweatshirts and everything you could want. Yes. But it's only available till Halloween. But we have all of our merch, or the, we have all the rest of our merch available all the time. And we have t-shirts, beanies, bags. Head on over. It helps us out. Yes. Generallyspooky.com. Yeah. Or there's a link in the bio. 
Well, I think that sums up our news for today. Well, I mean, Maddox's birthday was our only news. Yeah, that's, that's the big, the uh, big event. Yeah, absolutely. Shall we roll some music? Yeah, and find out what's happening today. And what you don't know if you've just heard that music is that that's actually Kieran singing. <laughs> Not a lot of people know that. No. Nope. It's actually you in the microphone every week, like screeching. Yeah. <laughs> I do it live every time. Mm-hmm. It just comes out that way. Today, we are talking about the Wolf of Badenoch. Right. Okay, Kieran, tell us all about it. I think. You've, t- you've stolen my thunder, so <laughs> come on. <laughs> That's all I have. You tell us all about it. I got a peek at the script. The script title. I wanted to steal your moment just to see your face. Rage and disgust for those at home. <laughs> yes, we're talking about The Wolf of Badenoch today. We and I'm excited. Did. This has been on my radar for a long time. I'm really curious to hear what what it is. Is it a wolf? Like an actual wolf? Or is it a person who was called the wolf? I don't know. Because we had our folklore episode last time. The grey, the big grey man of Ben McDewey. You should yes. totally check it out. It was super fun. It was. And it was coincidentally super like misty and foggy here the day yeah. after it came out. We had yeah, like f- four days of really heavy mist. And I stepped outside and when my foot hit the, the paving slabs, it did kind of sound different. It if did. you want to know why that's important, you should listen to the episode. Mm-hmm. I've, actually, I don't even think I told you. I got some feedback from quite a few people saying it's one of their favourite episodes. Oh yeah? Mm-hmm. That's exciting. I well, yeah, we've done our folklore episode for yes. this season. So, who or what is the wolf of Badenoch? Well, funnily enough, the wolf was not the wolf while the wolf was alive. Interesting. This nickname that has become infamous came after the wolf died. Ah, that's almost, well, I don't know the whole story yet, but that seems like a shame because that's a badass <laughs> nickname to have. To have been granted post humanously, humusly, humus, <laughs> like hummus, but po- not post humusly. <laughs> yeah. In the 1300s, the wolf was a man called Alexander Stuart, who was the Earl of Buchan, mm. and he was a very important and powerful man with a stinker of a reputation, Ooh. which he did earn. Well, that's good, I guess. But we're going to talk about whether he was really as bad as people thought he was. Oh, okay. And if he deserved this reputation and this title. Interesting. I'm intrigued. I was really hoping that would come up there, you know, because I write the script and I hope that I hook you in, because if I don't hook you in, no one else is going to listen. If I'm just sitting here picking my nose yeah. and I'm watching the pigeon out the window. Phew. Okay. We're over the hurdle. Yes. Alexander was born in 1343 to Robert Stewart and Elizabeth Muir. And from his birth, Alexander had a lot to live up to because his grandmother on his dad's side had been the daughter of Robert the Bruce. The... I'll give you a minute. Could you say that again? <laughs> his grandmother uh-huh. on his dad's side. Mm-hmm. So his dad's mum. Yes. Was the daughter of Robert the Bruce. Yes. Yes. Sorry. I got jumbled there. <laughs> <laughs> his grandmother was a woman called Marjorie Bruce and her dad was Robert the Bruce or... King Robert I of Scotland. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. A Marjorie had married a man called Walter Stuart, who was the sixth high steward of Scotland. That's a cool title. There's a lot of cool titles, isn't mm-hmm. there? So from the beginning, you know, he had a lot to, or he had big boots to fill. Yes, absolutely. His great grandfather was Robert the Bruce. <laughs> the Robert the Bruce. Yeah. It's like Robert the Burns. I was just about to say Robert the Burns. <laughs> Marjorie's younger brother was King David II of Scotland when their father died. Because, you know, she's the eldest, but she couldn't rule the country without a penis. Yes, yes. It comes up time and again. Yeah. Someone actually suggested we put that on a t-shirt. But she didn't have a penis. (laughs) I'm here for it. That would be superb. That's a great idea. (laughs) Anyway, we were talking about King David in our Dunrobin episodes. I think the first one. Mm. We talked about him a little bit. 
Couldn't say. I'll take your word on it. Well, I'm going to explain to you why we were talking about him in just a moment. Thank God. <laughs> I, didn't okay. bring, I didn't bring my notes from last time. Shame on you. Oh, no. You know there's an exam, right? Oh. oh. But you should have been studying. And be- have you not? I didn't do very well in the last exam. Oh, dear. Oh, no. If you would like us to do another end of season exam for Kieran over on Patreon, let us know. <laughs> do I get to vote on that? No. Or? Okay. Yeah. <laughs> King David was Alexander's great uncle. Okay. Just to keep us all on track with where we are. Uh, you might not remember, if you're listening, Kieran definitely doesn't. No. But we mentioned in our Dunrobin episode that King David didn't have any children. Okay. Which was causing problems. John of Sutherland was his heir. Oh, I see. He yes. was sort of a teenage boy and he was the closest male relative. He was his nephew. Nephew, I think nephew. But he died of the plague yes. in London. Yeah, he died of the actual plague. Yes. Which made Robert, Alexander's dad, the heir to the throne. Ah. So we're looking at the other side of it this time. Oh, okay. So these are the people who lucked out because the Sutherlands lost. Someone has to. The power's got to go somewhere. Okay, okay, I'm with you. Is he even bringing it all around? It's come back. But David and Robert, Alexander's dad, didn't get along. Mm. They did not like each other at all. David actually worked really hard to try and find alternatives to try and make sure that Robert didn't become king. Wow. Including marrying his mistress to try and produce an heir. I think when his wife died. I don't think they got divorced. He tried that, but nothing worked. Nothing worked. He even at one point considered giving the throne to an English heir. Wow. To try and stop Robert from becoming king. He was that determined. Mm-hmm. And there were other factors as well, because like, Scotland and England were at war and there was lots of conflict happening. So that, that was part of the reason. But your reaction there is how a lot of people felt at the time. Yeah. That they didn't like that at all. No, that's not, that's not good. And, and is this Robert, Robert the Bruce? No, this is Robert's grandson. Robert the Bruce's grandson. Okay. Alexander's dad. Yes. So Robert the Bruce's daughter had a son called Robert. Yep. As is always the case with these things. Yeah, that's fine. With me? Yes. I know it's confusing because they all have the same name. I'll try and... If you do get lost, just tell me. Yeah. At least it's a a different name this time. (laughs) (laughs) It's not John. They're not still all called John. Well, what I found odd is that David's dislike of Robert didn't seem to come from any kind of thought that he couldn't do the job that he was the heir to. Yeah, I kind of assume this never factors in. I, I feel there's never competence that people are like, oh, he's not fit for the job. It's just, he's a dick and I mm. hate him. Well, that kind of seems to be what this was. Yeah. Because David was imprisoned in England for a time, which we talked about with the hostage yep. situation. You can listen to our John Robin episodes if you'd like to know more about that. But Robert actually ruled Scotland while David was imprisoned. Oh, okay, yeah. He acted as regent because Mm -hmm. he was still at home. So he was already doing the job. So he knew what he was doing. Yes. He has some experience. Answers my question that I asked in the Dunrobin episode of who was in charge of Scotland while he's in prison? All comes back around. Mm -hmm. Despite his best efforts, I'm sure, David never had any children, as we know. And then he died in 1371, which made Robert... King Robert II of Scotland. There he is. King Bobby. King Bobby. So Alexander's dad is now king. Okay, okay. So Alexander's sitting pretty sweet then, isn't he? Yes, he is technically Prince of Scotland, but he never had that title. Mm -hmm. Robert was, or should we call him Bobby just for fun? We call him Bobby. Bobby was 55 when he became king. Okay. So he already had a wife and a family. Mm Mm-hmm. And I mentioned before that his wife was Elizabeth Muir. And they had at least 10 children together. That's good work. When 10 survived to become adults. So they may have had more. Mm -hmm. And one of them was Alexander. Got you. They got married in 1336, but they hadn't done it properly. Uh Uh-oh. What does that mean? Well, it was either without the permission of the Pope. Oh, yes. Which was a thing. 
or they had a common law marriage or some kind of hand fasting ceremony. Yes, you talked rather about than a Christian marriage. I'm with you. I'm with you. So although they had technically gotten married, it hadn't been official, mm-hmm. and they had started having children. Oh, which is a problem. That is a problem. So they got married again in 1349. Interesting. And this made all of their children legitimate. Ah. Which is important. Unbastardized them. <laughs> yeah. Because they they had gotten married, but they hadn't gotten married. Y- yes, they sort of hadn't done it legally, so to speak. Yeah. They hadn't done their paperwork down at the council. Uh, that kind of thing. Mm-hmm. We have an extra episode on Gretna Green and hand fasting and marriage and things over on Patreon if you're interested. We do indeed. It was very fun to do. Mm-hmm. Elizabeth, his wife, actually died before 1371, which was when Robert became king. Oh, okay. So she died before then. And he remarried after her death, which was common. Mm -hmm. And he and his wife had four children together. So this is 14 children, at least. Because these are just the ones we know about. Yes. I can see this coming to a head when power gets passed down. Yeah. Yeah, kind of. That's a lot of contesting for who should get it, isn't it? Yes, I actually had to write two versions of the script because it was just driving me insane, getting (laughs) lost in all the titles. So I do actually have a list of some of the titles that he divvied out to his children uh, when he became king, which I'll get to in a second. Mm -hmm. Uh, Because along with these 14 children, Robert also had, or Bobby, sorry. Bobby. Bobby, King Bobby. Robert the Bruce and then Bobby, his grandson. Yes. Bobby also had at least 12 children with multiple mistresses. Oh, dang. So Bobby had at least 26 children. That's, that's a lot. <laughs> that's just kind of a lot. Crazy. Mm-hmm. When so many of the, the rulers end up not being able to have any. Well, David had no children. Well, there you go. It's because he's, he's stealing them all. <laughs> yeah, stealing. Just throwing the averages out. Bobby the baby stealer. <laughs> <laughs> but having all these children, you caught on to quickly having all these children meant that bobby could consolidate his power Mm. because he's able to ensure that his children are in positions of power and they support him which you need as king yes i mean would you even recognize all your children when there was 26 of them i mean if they looked like you i guess (laughs) (laughs) one really distinguished feature like having to like check how their ears look or like Like a mole yeah (laughs) the family birthmark All of his sons had titles. Even a lot of the illegitimate ones were given titles, which, again, was fairly common. I think we talked about that as well. Um, And had land given to them. And his daughters were married off to other important men Mm. that he hadn't birthed. (laughs) So consolidated his authority even further because he had all of these connections. Damn, you just divvy up like the whole of Scotland like that, didn't you? Well, yeah, I did put together a rough list of the important titles that his sons had Mm -hmm. because obviously his daughters didn't. Do you want to hear it? I would. I, would I took like. it out of the original script, but I can read it to you. No, I'd like that. Okay. So his children and his children-in-law, so his sons-in-law, included the future King of Scotland, oh, which makes sense, mm-hmm. uh, the Earl of Fife, who was also the Duke of Albany, Okay. the Earl of Buchan, Lord of the Isles, mm-hmm. Earl of Murray, Earl of Douglas, Lord High Constable of Scotland, Lord High Admiral... Lord High Admiral of Scotland, Earl of Strathern and Caithness, and the Earl of Athol. Damn. And we've touched on quite a lot of these titles. We have. So at one point they were all... Related to him. Related to him. This is why if you've ever tried to look into your family history and you have ancestors in Scotland, there are a lot of people who can look back through their family tree and say that they're related to Robert the Bruce. I was just thinking that, yeah. This is why. Oh. Like I, I have a granny's brother did it. Uh-huh. He worked the family tree and he traced it all the way back to Robert the Bruce and the Lord of the Isles. And a lot of people can do that. And this is kind of the reason. That would make sense. That's really doing it early as well to have 26 separate branches that then all fill out. Yeah. It's a lot. So all of that being said... Not much is really said about Alexander until around the time that his dad becomes king. Okay. Because remember, this is the 1300s, so it is a long time ago. Mm -hmm. So the records in places are a bit patchy. But not much is really said about him until around 1370. 
when Robert took the throne, or Bobby, sorry, when Bobby took the throne, Alexander took on the title of Lord of Badenoch. That does make sense with the, the name of the episode. Yes. From what I've been able to tell, Alexander was effectively already the Lord of Badenoch. Okay. But he didn't have the title, his dad did. Got you. And when his dad became king, he gave Alexander the title. That makes sense. That makes I think sense. Bobby was busy being regent and doing other things. Yeah. So his son was looking after things. Does that make sense? Mm-hmm. Alexander had been in charge of Badenoch for years and he had garnered quite a reputation. As an arsehole? Yeah, not... He wasn't great. Mm. He had a reputation for some not good reasons. Alexander was making a lot of enemies. And mainly down to the way that he decided to maintain control over his land. Uh Uh-oh. And how he decided to maintain his authority over the lesser lords who lived on his land or nearby. It's not good word choice so far, is it? No. Alexander used Cataran forces to keep everyone in line. What's that? Have you heard of Catarans before? I have not. Basically, they're bands of paid mercenaries who would rough anyone up that he wanted. Nice. Yeah. That would do it. And so- they forced people to cough up protection money to uh. keep them at bay. <laughs> so they were sort of like the Reavers we've talked about before. but they Kind were- of. Hirelings. Well, yeah, they were hired by Alexander, so he was paying them. Yes. And then if he had any grievances, they would deal with it. But they would also force people to give them money so that they wouldn't attack them. Uh, He got himself some goons. Yeah, pretty much. Yeah. But this was something that Alexander had seen his father do before him. Oh, okay. So he had been doing it. And although people down south saw what Alexander was doing and saw it as being really barbaric and cruel. King Robert was very lenient with him. Well, if he's doing what, if Alexander's doing what Bobby also did, you can't get too upset really, can you? Well, yeah. And I I was reading a lot into it because I couldn't really understand it to begin with. But certainly Bobby felt that this kind of harsh rule and this like iron fist way of ruling yep. was necessary in the highlands oh. <laughs> because if no 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 it's it, it there is a reason okay <laughs> because it fits better with how gallic society operated oh okay <laughs> like outside of the king and uh-huh. southern society this was kind of how gallic society worked just a bunch of hard nuts <laughs> so bobby and alexander continued it but because they were royal it was a bit iffy. Well, it doesn't paint a great picture. No. Like, I am I have an image in my head of someone who's a bit of an arsehole already. And not just because he's not a wrong. royal. You're not yeah. wrong. <laughs> but it's interesting seeing it that way, that they were actually doing things the way that a lot of the Gallic region was. Yeah, that is super interesting. And then they figured that people would respond to it better because it's what they recognised. Yeah. But people down south didn't like it. Well, that's quite funny, isn't it? Because it's people down south getting offended on behalf of someone else without talking to the person they're offended on the behalf of, necessarily. But what's interesting is, sort of later on, as this continues, the Alexander doing this, he's kind of credited with deepening the chasm between the Highlands and the Lowlands. Oh, really? Because they just didn't understand each other. Yeah. And he's part, or he's said to be part of the reason for that big divide. Hmm. That's interesting. I'm. We'll probably get into it. But I wonder if that's fair, or he was just the scapegoat that highlighted it. Not even the scapegoat, but like I think he's just one of the reasons. Yeah. But a lot of people knew about him. Yes, he was more public facing. Yeah. He brought attention to something that was already ongoing. But it's interesting to see because when I read that he was using paid mercenaries, I was like, oh my god. Yeah, that's exactly how I reacted. But then reading deeper, it's like, oh well. I don't know. I don't know how I feel about that anymore. Yeah. If that's just how things are done. But it, it was coercive control. Well, yeah. That can't be doubted. Mm-hmm. The Highlands were particularly unruly because they were so far away from the physical like, king himself. So the yep. king would usually be down in Stirling or somewhere. Uh-huh. So the chances of 
him being able to come up and sort them out were minimal. Yeah, that makes sense. So that was one of the reasons that having a harsher rule was necessary. Mm -hmm. Because the the Highlands were quite violent and pretty unruly at this time. Very north of the wall. Yeah, and a lot of, certainly like the Gallic regions out towards the west, they didn't see the king as their king. Oh, yeah. You have the Lord of the Isles. So it's a completely different system. They don't see the king in the same way as someone in Edinburgh would. Yes. So you kind of have to remember that too. Yeah. It's just hard to place yourself there, isn't it? To understand all the nuance of the civilization that existed within that. Well, it's knowing that, oh, this is kind of a tangent now, but Scotland was made up of lots of different people. Mm -hmm. Scotland wasn't always unified. Yeah, and they're very distinct, these different groups, Mm -hmm. it seems. So it kind of comes from that place, and it's before it's become properly unified. Yeah. So there is conflict. Yes. And different heritages. Mm. So what does Wolfie do next? Well, before Robert had become king, Alexander had been making enemies, like I said. And one of these was a pretty formidable opponent. Mm. Because Alexander had made an enemy of the Catholic Church. Ooh, that's a tough one. I I thought you were going to say a person. No. Just the whole Catholic Church. Well, I'll explain, I'll explain. But this is before the Scottish Reformation, so... Catholicism is still practiced in Scotland. It is today, but with the Reformation, a lot of the Catholic churches were destroyed. And that's a a story for another time. Alexander had been bristling against the Bishop of Murray, who at the time was a man called Alexander Burr. But I'm going to call him the Bishop or the Bishop of Murray because they both have the same name. Yep, appreciate that. The Bishop was angry that Alexander's men were forcing people who were living on the church's land to pay up for protection against them. Oh, that's fair. That's fair. And he felt that Alexander was overreaching. Mm -hmm. And he definitely was. The reason (laughs) that his men were hassling people who lived on the bishopric's land is because paying for mercenaries is expensive. Yes. So he had to overreach to pay for his men. Yeah. That's... It's tricky. It's tricky. Um, but I can definitely see why the church wouldn't like that. Yeah, it's it was very complicated. This is one of the things I really struggled with mm-hmm. doing this episode, was whether the church owned and ruled their land or not. Because I think the bishop's land was part of Alexander's land. Uh, yeah, yeah. But it's a a weird relationship where Alexander owns it, but doesn't really. Yeah. He has responsibility for it, but he can't profit off it. Mm-hmm. It's a whole thing. That is tricky. Yeah. I, I spent like a whole day trying to figure this out. You were so de- I've just decided to say it's complicated <laughs> and I don't really understand it. You were despairing. I caught yeah. you despairing quite a few times that day. Yeah. <laughs> we're, we're here though. It's happening. <laughs> In 1368, so three years before Bobby becomes king, mm-hmm. Alexander and his father had been imprisoned in Loch Leven Castle oh. by King David. Oh, As part of his plot to keep them away from the throne? Well, kind of. It seems like he took advantage of a scenario that worked for him. So the reason they were locked away seems to be because they were both using these Cataran forces and causing disruption, which the king didn't like, because he was getting lots of complaints. (laughs) Um, Because Alexander was using his men to extort people and murder people if he wanted. Yeah, he just took it too far, it seems. And then Robert... uh, then Bobby couldn't keep him under control. Mm -hmm. So he locked them both away. But it seems to be an excuse for David to lock up the nephew that he hated. Yeah. To make an example of him. I mean, it can be both. Yeah, I think it's both. I think it's both. Sneaky, but fair play. We've heard of worse being done. Yeah. Where you're going to hear about worse being done. Oh, well. Don't you worry. (laughs) Don't you worry. In 1370... Alexander actually had to sign a document to promise to protect the Bishop of Murray and his lands and his men. Yes. Which seems to be a response to all of the problems that he had been causing. Yep. So you can't, you can't attack him anymore. You have to protect him and his land Uh and his people. So you have to protect it from yourself. Yeah. From your own goons. Mm -hmm. It's a shame that he gets that and nobody else does. So nobody else gets oh, the this bishop. protection. I thought you meant Alexander. No, it's a shame the bishop gets the protection. 
But well, I guess because it's Alexander's land. Like, yeah. He is the law. Sitting there going, if you don't like it, you can just move. Like, move? It's the 1300s. People don't move. <laughs> How far am I going to get? <laughs> There's actual wolves out there. <laughs> When 1371 came around, when Bobby became king, Alexander was officially made the Lord of Badenoch, like we said, making him a powerful and wealthy man. And throughout the 1370s, he just became more powerful and more wealthy. Okay, okay. He was just gathering land like it was nobody's business. Scooping it all up. Mm -hmm. He had multiple castles. One of them was Ruthven Castle. And the ruins of what's now Ruthven Barracks are still standing cool. um, beside the A9 between Inverness and Abbey Moor. Yep. That was one castle. It was a castle when he was there. But another one of his castles, which is far cooler in my opinion, and I think you're going to love this, Kieran. Yes. Is Loch and Dorb Castle. Oh, hell yeah. The one out on the middle of like a little lake. Yeah. Thing. it's The castle was built on an island in the middle of a loch. That's badass. Not far from here. Yep. We've driven past it. The island in the middle is man-made. Oh, yeah? Mm-hmm. Wow. That's very cool. Mm-hmm. And archaeologists think that there might have been a Cranagh there at some point. Oh. One of the, the ancient buildings out in the middle of the loch. Yeah. They Cran- think there might have been one. They found a, an ancient like, wooden beam oh. that they think might have been a Cranagh. That's very cool. It's worth Googling Cranagh. Mm-hmm. C-R-A-N-N-O-G. Yep. You can go visit one down in Perthshire. You can. They've recreated one and I really, really want to go. Yep. There's even a legend about this area, like around Loch and Dorb, that a mythical queen of the castle a long time ago burned down the forest that used to surround the loch because the landscape's quite bare now. Uh-huh. Because her husband w- cared more about his hunting hounds than he cared about her. Oof. So she burned the forest down. Burn it to the ground. And there are remains in the area of a forest that seems to have burned down at one point. What? They found like, remains of burnt trees. That is amazingly cool. Ooh. Mm-hmm. That's awesome. So Lockendorp Castle was Alexander's. Mm. He lived there quite a lot. It seems to have been a favourite haunt of his. And now, in the present, it has a really cool nickname. Oh, yeah? We had the Castle of Spite in our Dun Robin episodes. Yes. But I think this is even better. Lockendorp Castle is known by some people as the Wolf's Lair. Ooh, that's cool. That is cool. It's definitely how I'm referring to it from now on. Like, it doesn't get cooler than that. No. It's a castle out in the middle of a loch called the Wolf's Lair. That is cool, but not the Wolf Slayer. No. That's different. <laughs> <laughs> I did actually consider trying to get us out there mm-hmm. just for this episode, but you can only get there by boat. Tricky. So it's very cold here at the minute. It's the end of October. And we do have a paddleboard. We've got a paddleboard. That we would be able to use. It's not too far. No. But I didn't want to fall in. <laughs> I was about to say, I'm not confident enough not to fall off of it. But you can camp there. You can take a tent and camp. That would be fun. And someone's built a fire pit right in the middle of the island. Oh, Nice. So you can go and stay. I thought it would be good. Yeah. But I didn't want to fall in the water. Nope. Nope. No time for that one. (laughs) So those were just two of his castles. He had other castles aside from them. Yes. That's good going. And throughout the 1370s, he amassed an incredible amount of land. He leased land in Uckert, which we talked about in our Uckert, which we talked about in our Uckert Castle episode. It's down by Loch Ness. He leased land around there from his younger half-brother. Oh, yeah. He was given the barony of Strathaven, which bordered his land in Badenoch, so made it even bigger. Damn. He gained land around Aberdeen and down near Perth. And later he gained land in Caithness, which is further north. Oh, shit. He's just cleaning up. Yes. Yeah. And when you consider that Scotland is not a big country. No. This is massive. He had huge tracts of land throughout the north. He was one of the biggest authorities in the highlands i can see that pissing people off yeah you can imagine always does well what what happens from here well while his father was king nothing really he alexander could conduct business the way he wanted he had a lot of freedom his dad didn't really do much fair he just kind of let him do what he wanted (laughs) so he could bully people he could kill whoever he wanted he could extort whoever he wanted 
And he didn't really have to pay any attention to what the church wanted him to do. He just did as he pleased. Damn. Well, I suppose that's good for Bobby because that's more power and land within his family. Well, yeah. So it's still within his own. And he won't be cha- he will likely not be challenged by his own son. Well, Bobby has no reason to do anything. He yeah. has no reason to intervene. Is Alexander the oldest son? No, he is not. Okay. okay. Which we're going to talk about in just a bit. He is the third son. Oh, so he didn't have the first penis. No. So he's still not good enough. No, he doesn't have the biggest penis. No. In 1382, Alexander got married. And this union would make him the lord of most of the highlands. <laughs> so think about everything he already has. Yeah. He married Euphemia I, who was Countess of Ross. Oh. And she controlled a lot of land in her own right. So through this marriage, he now controlled Ross, the Isle of Lewis, the Isle of Skye, oh and England. Oh my God. Oh my days. That is most of the highlands. Yeah. On top of what he already had. I have in my head a, a big risk board of Scotland and him just slowly spreading across the Pretty top. Pretty much. Yeah. That's what it's like. He he had everything. Yeah. And it just seems mental. Surely he can't just keep getting more land and power. Why not? Well, it just always goes wrong. It goes wrong somewhere. Some, something's going to happen. Something's coming. Something's coming. <laughs> Through this marriage, Alexander basically doubled how much land he owned. But he never became the official Earl of Ross because the title belonged to Euphemia. Oh, yes. Again, which we talked about in the Dunrobin episode. Uh-huh. It works that way sometimes. Bobby did make him the Earl of Buchan instead, though. As a as a treat. <laughs> yeah, like a, so he didn't lose out. So he was still of equal standing with his wife. But he was Earl of a different part of the country. Yep. Where is Buchan? Buchan down south. You know how people from Liverpool are Liverpudlians and Glasgow, Glaswegian, are Buckins, mother Buckins. <laughs> <laughs> they should be. Or mother now, Buckers. <laughs> this is going to be funny to some people and not funny to others. Because I said down south, mm-hmm. but Buckin is only slightly south from here. It's to the east. Oh, is it south of us? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but to me, it's south. <laughs> but it's just south of Fraserburgh, but north of Aberdeen. South of Aberdeen. Okay, over, over yonder. About as east as you can go. Yes. But... To me, being from Ullapool and living where we are, it's down south. Yep, yep. (laughs) Euphemia, the woman that Alexander had married, had been widowed before she married Alexander. And she had had a bit of a hard time of it. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. Her father had been the Earl of Ross, which is what later made her the Countess. Mm -hmm. And because the Earldom of Ross was so significant, the royals had been meddling with her life for a really long time. Because... It's it's the title. That's all they care about. King David, who had come before Bobby, had ordered Euphemia to marry a man called Walter Leslie in 1366. And the reason for this was because he wanted to reward Leslie with an earldom for oh. how he had fought on David's behalf and how he had fought during the Crusades. Oh, well, that's nice. That's nice for her, isn't it? Gross. Mm-hmm. He wanted to reward this man, so he ordered her to marry him. Effectively bestowing her birthright on him. Yeah. Presu- as a treat. Presumably she had to. Yeah, she had no say in the matter. David ruled that unless Euphemia agreed to marry Leslie, he wouldn't renew the earldom for her father. Oh, so yeah. So they would he, lose everything. He could just strip the title, couldn't yeah. he? So she was completely backed in a corner. And David made this the rule after like, being told and finding out that Euphemia's fa- father, that Euphemia's father didn't want her to marry Leslie. Oh. So David made it that she had to. Ugh. More women of history being shat on. Right, just to reward this guy. Yeah. So you deserve this, so I'm going to make this woman marry you so you can have what she has. Ugh. It's awful. Awful. I hate it. She couldn't even catch a break when David died in 1371. Oh no. King Bobby, Alexander's dad, was a close ally of Euphemia's father. Oh, yeah. They had gotten along very well, because they're both lords in the north. Yep. And although Bobby had the power to change the rules and make it so that Euphemia and Leslie weren't married anymore, uh-huh. he didn't. Well, that's shitty, isn't it? Yeah. Oh, great, can you undo this? No. Why not? I just don't want to, really. And then Euphemia's father died in 1372. 
so the year after. Oh, no. Making her the countess, but also making her husband incalculably wealthy. Oh, does she murder him? Is that no. How he gets widowed? No, she doesn't. Mr. Trick. It's just, it's such a shame, because she was used as a pawn. Uh-huh. But it seems like she was even less than a pawn. Because she was the, the prize. Yeah. Or like worse than that, she represented the prize. Well, she held the prize. She, she was a legal proceeding. Yeah, she came with the prize. Horrible. It's sick. Sick. So she gets widowed and it all goes back to her. Well, before we get there, okay. she and Walter Leslie had two children together. Yep. Alexander and Mariotta. And we'll come back to them later. Leslie died in 1382. So he and Euphemia were married for 16 years, Mm. making her a widow. 16 long years. Yeah. I mean, even if the marriage is happy, it's still shit. Yeah. But the same year that Leslie died, Euphemia was married off to Alexander. The same year? Yeah. It was like a matter of months. Oh, no. And I have to assume that this was also arranged in a similar way because... It made Alexander so powerful. Yes. And the king would have the authority to ensure that that happens. Who is Alexander's father? Yeah, you have to assume. Because why else would it be the same year? Mm -hmm. (sighs) Right? Pish. So Alexander's sitting pretty. Well, yeah. He's got the land, the power, more titles than he can count. I have in my script that everything's coming up Millhouse. Coming up Millhouse. From The Simpsons. Oh, yeah. Everything's coming up Millhouse. Oh, yeah. (laughs) (laughs) Nice. (laughs) But all of this began changing in the late 1380s. Okay. So they got married in 82. Mm. King Bobby wasn't as popular as he had once been by this point. And while there were other reasons, a major reason was people felt that Bobby wasn't doing enough to control Alexander and bring him into line. Yes, he's just spreading his way across the highlands. Mm -hmm. People were seeing this, they were seeing the way he was conducting himself. They didn't like it, but then they were watching the king do nothing about it. I mean, that would annoy you. Mm -hmm. Especially if you were one of the ones being steamrolled and bullied by him. Exactly. A lot of people were very unhappy. Yeah. So while Alexander was the major force and authority in the north... Yes. His older brother, John, was the main authority in the south. Oh. Even more so than their father. Interesting. How does... I wonder how that came to be. I'm going to tell you. Well, good. (laughs) (laughs) John became the Earl of Carrick when Robert became... uh, John became the Earl of Carrick when Bobby became king. So I'm going to refer to him as Carrick from here. Yep. Because it's just easier. Old Carrick top. Yeah, it's a better identifier, I think. I think so. Carrick had been watching their father make all of these mistakes during his reign. Had been hearing all of the bad things people were saying about Alexander and their father and how he's handling his son's behaviour. Yep. And he figured that he could use it to his advantage. Carrick was the eldest son. I was just about to ask. And he was getting a bit fed up of his father living for so long. (laughs) It was his turn. Yep, yep, I can see that being a common thought. So in November 1384, King Bobby was effectively dethroned. Oh shit. And Carrick was given authority in his place without actually being made king. I didn't know, I didn't know you could do that. How was he? It was a coup d'etat. Oh, la-di-da. Did we say the same thing there? (laughs) Yeah. Yeah, Yeah. that's how you say it. I thought so. Oh, oh. oh. See, Carrick had the support of the council. Okay. If the king doesn't have the support of the council, they can make moves to make someone else in charge. Interesting. So Bobby became a figurehead, but Carrick was in control. He was made guardian of Scotland. Oh. Got you. With me? Yep. I didn't know that was an option. Mm Mm-hmm. They made it an option. Yeah, you've got to really fucked up for that to be the case. There were other things. We won't get too into it here because yeah. we don't need to. But one of the reasons was Bobby not doing enough to bring Alexander to heel. Oh shit. So what's Carrick going to do? Well, from what I saw, he kind of talked a big game where Alexander was concerned, but <laughs> didn't really follow through. 
That'll be what happens when the person you're shit talking has more power, men, and influence than you do. Kind of. Carrick wanted to take his brother down a peg. Uh, he didn't like the way he conducted himself, and he didn't like how much power he had in the north. It's not a good look for them. Yep. Like you said, like he has the firepower behind him. Yeah. He has all the titles, all the land, everything. And all the savages. <laughs> <laughs> but when you become king, other responsibilities tend to crop up and other fires start that you have to put out. Oh, that's true. And you can't really get round to what you want to do. Yep. I'm sure there's a lot of parents and teachers who can sympathise with that. <laughs> and that, that's what happened with Carrick. He was able to take some steps against Alexander, but nothing substantial. Uh-huh. Because a lot of his time was taken up dealing with English invasions to the south. Ah. So he had that to deal with. Those pesky things. Mm-hmm. So he couldn't fully commit all of his time to dealing with his brother. In 1385 and 1386, things were done, though. Alexander's half-brother claimed that he was keeping Ucker illegally, and he wanted it back. Yep. Because he leased it. Uh Uh-huh. And this ended up being resolved in Alexander's favour, in Alexander's favour, because his brother died. Well. (laughs) So he kept the land. (laughs) That's one way to settle an argument, isn't it? Mm -hmm. I couldn't see the circumstances of his brother's death. Mm. so there's a bit of a question mark over that one yeah it's not necessarily suspicious but i'm still suspicious Mm -hmm. the neighboring earl of murray who he was also related to yep tried to land a blow he tried to get justice for his men who he claimed alexander's men had murdered okay yeah which again seems likely seems the case the earl of murray brought this to the council And I don't really know how that ended, but it doesn't seem like much was done. No, justice for Barb. Justice for Barb. One of the reasons I think the Earl of Murray didn't get very far is because Alexander had been appointed justiciar north of the Forth. Ooh, that doesn't sound so good. So he was the head justice officer for the north of Scotland. Ah, can't be doing that to the man who's most powerful. So he is now his own lawman. Yep. I think he was made the justiciar by his father. We are heading towards a serious, like, breakdown of, like, power madness. You You think? I would have thought so. All this power, and now he's his own judge. It's not good. It's not good. No. I think it happened before Bobby lost his authority. Mm -hmm. But I couldn't really tell. But he has this title, and I would believe if that was part of the reason the Earl of Murray didn't get anywhere. Yeah, Okay, uh, I'm just going to check with me if this is okay. Uh, turns out I say it is, so on we go. It's like number 10. Yeah, pretty much, yeah. All those COVID parties. <laughs> no, they didn't happen, and if they did happen, it's fine. Like, why are you going on about it all the time? Uh, yeah, we'll look into it and decide if it's fine. Yeah, it's fine. We've decided, so good. We're off the hook. Sorry. Arseholes. Now, despite him having been desperate for power, Carrick didn't do a great job. Oh, no. Yeah, he didn't do great. A lot of his time, like I said, was dealt with, was taken up dealing with the English. I'm not going to talk too much about it because that's a lot to do with the Wars of Independence, which we are shelving for next year. Yep. Stay tuned. In 1388, Carrick fought in the Battle of Otterburn, which happened in the north of England. And he ended up being kicked by a horse. Oh. Oh, no. So it didn't go well for him, despite it being a victory for the Scottish forces. Yeah. It was a pretty severe injury. As you could imagine. Yes. And it had a big impact on his ability to rule. Because Cause he he's was been, not in a good way. Because he's been kicked by a horse. And on top of that, even if he was still able to rule as he had been, it impacted how other people felt about him. Yeah. Because they looked at him and thought he couldn't rule properly. Oh, that's a shame. Mm-hmm. Oh, that would be sore. Yeah. Kicked by a horse. Kicked by a horse. It's another way a horse leg can be a weapon. Oh, that's true. That's true. Not when you're wielding it, though. No. The battle was a big blow to his health, but also to his authority, because the Earl of Douglas at that time, who he was also related to, (laughs) he was one of his biggest and most influential supporters. He had come out in support of Carrick during the coup and everything, and we know that the Douglas family were very powerful. Yep. The Earl of Douglas was killed in this battle. Oh, no. So Carrick had lost one of his big pillars of authority. Because he didn't have his support anymore. 
And being kicked by a horse. Yeah. That's not good. So it left him vulnerable, Uh basically. And the council that had given him the power to rule took it away again. Oh, no. (laughs) Does it go back to Bobby? No, it goes to Carrick's younger brother. Oh, we're making our way down. Robert, the Duke of Albany. Okay. So this was the second of Alexander's older brothers. He was the third son. Yes, you said that. With me? Yep. So they granted Albany power in 1388, the same year as the battle. Uh Uh-huh. And by all accounts, it might seem a bit strange because we're talking about the wolf of Badenoch, but Albany might have been even worse. Oh, no. And may have been the most ruthless and the most brutal of all the brothers. Oh, that's not good. And we're going to talk about it later, why Alexander has this reputation and Albany doesn't really have it. Yeah. We'll talk about it. Better PR team. But we've talked about Albany before. Have we? Yes. So I'm going to let you think on that one and we'll come back to it. Okay. Okay. Albany was much harsher on Alexander than Carrick had been. Sounds like it was needed somewhat. Well, he didn't just disapprove of Alexander's behaviour. Albany wanted the power that Alexander had. That makes more sense. He wanted it for himself. Yeah. So he knew he had to do something about him if he wanted to take what he had. Yep, yep. With me? Uh Uh-huh. Alexander was stripped of his justiciar title. Oh. He was deemed unfit, and Albany gave it to his own son instead. Oh, that's, is that better? Which must have been pretty humiliating. Yeah. That's not really better, it's just different. Mm-hmm. But it made Albany considerably more popular. Because Alexander had been deemed, quote, useless to the community, unquote. Yeah, I imagine his power was used mainly to excuse himself and his well, men. This judgment came from the council. They called him this. Nice. Useless to the community. <laughs> Well, uh, that's like the worst thing you could be Mm -hmm. as a person in a position of power. It's not good. So Albany was taking steps to try and lessen his brother's influence, which Carrick hadn't been able to do. Yeah. Well, he's gone about it the right way so far. Mm -hmm. In 1389, things really started to crumble for Alexander. Oh, no. And he started feeling some heat. Uh Uh-oh. So it's coming. It's coming. What I neglected to mention before is that Alexander and Euphemia's marriage was an utter disaster. Oh, yeah? It was not happy, it was not good, and it hadn't produced any children. Ooh, useless. But that didn't mean that Alexander hadn't been a busy man. No. Because it's thought that he was the father of more than 40 children. 40 children? Damn, that's a lot of litters. I can't even... Can't even imagine that. 40 children. 40 children. With multiple women. He, well, yeah. She, he hasn't just forced one woman to endure that. <laughs> Her whole life. Yeah. In 1389, Euphemia formally approached the Bishop of Murray, Alexander Burr, who our Alexander already had a sour relationship with, yep. and the Bishop of Ross. Oh. And she told them that her marriage to Alexander was a sham. Oh, that can't be good. So you might be wondering, well, why? It sounds pretty standard for most middle-aged marriages, really. Well, yeah. And I mean middle ages, not just middle-aged, middle-aged people. Age. <laughs> well, Euphemia revealed to the bishops that Alexander wasn't living with her and they were barely together. Oh. And the reason for this is that Alexander was living as husband and wife with another woman. Well, that's not ideal. To say the least. Some accounts claim that he was holed up in Lockendorp Castle with her, away from everybody. I mean, if he's having 40 children, he's obviously been shacked up with pretty much everybody, really. <laughs> pretty much everybody. Pretty much everybody. Everybody around, just humping his way around the highlands. <laughs> Alexander was living with his mistress, a woman called Myrid. Some people think she was the daughter of I Mackay, <laughs> who we talked about. He was the fourth of Strathnaver, and he's the one who was murdered at Dingwall Castle. Yes. Which we talked about by the Sutherlands. I'm a guy. Myrid was a Gallic woman, as you might expect, with a name like Myrid, mm-hmm. a Highlander. Not someone that a prince should marry. No. But it seems like they might have had a common law marriage or a hand fasting ceremony. Oh. Before he got married to Euphemia. Ooh. 
So technically, he was already married. Yes. Well, I can see why him and Euphemia didn't have any children. Oh, they didn't really have a chance. Yeah, if they were just never together and hated each other. But this is another instance where Alexander probably learnt that this was totally fine from his dad's example. Well, yeah. Because Bobby had mistresses and he had a common law marriage with his first wife before they got remarried. I'm just doing as daddy did. (laughs) Just Alexander probably hadn't counted on having to marry someone else. Yep, yep. Well, he's put himself up shit creek now, hasn't he? Mm -hmm. He and Myrid had several children and it seems like some of his sons went raiding on his behalf in the early 1390s throughout Badenoch which suggests that Alexander and Myrid had been together as early as the 1370s. Oh. So he and Euphemia got together, they married in 1382. Ah. So he and Myrid had been together for about 10 years. Oh, it's almost... I was going to say it's almost a shame for him, but it's not. It's a shame for her then, that she's just got wheeled in, had to give him all her land and everything, and then just got put in a castle somewhere. Precisely. Brutal. Mm-hmm. So Euphemia lifted the lid on all of it. Whistleblower. She was obviously fed up with how she's been treated by the man she had been forced to marry. Yep, yep. He definitely married her for the power. He was taking advantage of what she owned. He was using that to leverage getting more land yeah. because he was so powerful. He was making the money. He was taking everything. And he had just left her. He had abandoned her completely. Oh my God. What arsehole. The dog of Badenoch, me thinks. I think so. Sending out his wolf cubs on raids. <laughs> Marriage was a church matter. So that's why she brought her complaint to the bishops yes. rather than to the king. Yep. But it seems like Alexander's brother, Albany, had a hand in Euphemia's decision. Oh. From what people have been able to see, it seems like he was encouraging her to do it because if she did this, there's a chance that Alexander would lose everything that he had got through their marriage. Ah, that would be useful for Albany. Mm-hmm. If he, if it halved how much land Alexander owned. That would be pretty sweet. And I'd say it would be good for Euphemia, but presumably she'll get immediately remarried to somebody else. Well, we'll see. We'll, we'll see. see. We'll see. In November 1389, a meeting of sorts was held in Elgin, and Alexander had been forced to come. <laughs> And this was actually a meeting I talked about in the John Robin episode. One of the Sutherlands was there. Mm. A lot of people were present for this meeting. And Alexander was basically ordered to go back to Euphemia and be her husband. Because he had entered this agreement, this sacred union. Mm. So he was ordered to return to her. Oh, I assumed they would get divorced. But this was kind of pre-divorce, wasn't it? A little bit. Well, just hold on. Sorry, sorry, sorry. He was also ordered not to use any of his men against her, Mm. which I'm guessing refers to the Cataran forces. Yes. So that he couldn't intimidate her into dropping her complaint to just let him continue as he had been. Yeah. That's what I'm assuming, reading between the lines. I read in one place, so I don't know if this is true, that Alexander countered this demand and he asked the Bishop of Murray to dissolve his marriage with Euphemia. Okay, okay. But I'm not sure if that's actually the case. I don't know if he would ask for that because he would lose a lot. Yeah. It's almost more romantic that way. Mm-hmm. Because then it's like, no, I want to be with the woman I love. But I don't know if he would have done that. Yeah, I don't know if he would have cared that much. Well, it's not even that. It's just this situation suits him fine. Like, what can Euphemia do about it? That's true. Why would he change anything? Yeah. You know? So I don't know. I don't know if that's the case. don't know. But the bishop... Alexander Burr, the Bishop of Murray, ultimately ordered Alexander to return to Euphemia. Yes. And Alexander agreed to go back and be her husband. Assumedly so he wouldn't lose all of her land. Yep. Because he stood to lose a lot. But this didn't last. Uh Uh-oh. Alexander, again, completely abandoned Euphemia and he went back to be with Myrid. So he just went, yeah, 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 totally, totally. Five days later. I'm just going to bail, actually. Literally. I don't know how long this took. <laughs> no, no. But it it was a matter of months at the most. You imagine just him sitting down to dinner with Euphemia every night in silence. They're going to bed at night in silence. And eventually just going, 
fuck it, I'm just gonna go. I'm just gonna go back to my. She her crack's way better because I can't imagine you female was necessarily happy at that outcome. I imagine she would have wanted it to be dissolved to get rid of this guy. Well, I guess I think she just wanted to make a point of the way he was treating her. Yeah, fair. And she had been encouraged that this was the right thing to do. Yes. I think the goal was getting the marriage dissolved. Yeah. But that's a difficult thing to do in the 1300s. Big time. But now Alexander has gone back to live with Myrid, so not only is he going against his wife's wishes or the demands of his marriage, he's now going against direct orders from the church. Ooh, can we do that? he's been pulled up on this already. He was told to go back to her. And now he hasn't. And he's already pissed off the church. Exactly. So you see why he's in big trouble. Yes. Because they already don't like him. Uh Uh-oh. What are they going to do? Well, the Bishop of Murray found out that Alexander hadn't done what they told him to do. So he excommunicated him from the church. I imagine that was quite a serious thing. Yes. Because belief in God is... Like a life or death thing. Mm-hmm. Oh. It's the saviour of your soul. Yes. This is... I'm struggling to imagine it, but it must be the harshest of punishments. It's a very big deal. Mm-hmm. A very big deal. Apparently a monk was sent to inform Alexander of his excommunication and he was sent to Lockendorp Castle to tell him. And Alexander was so enraged at what the bishop had done that he locked the monk away in the pit dungeon under the castle. You can't do that to the messenger. Well, the, this dungeon was usually at least partially filled with water. Because oh. remember, it's in the middle of a lock. That did pop into my head. Oh no. So this excommunication really cemented the bad blood between the Alexanders. Yeah, big time. Mm-hmm. Poor monk. Poor monk indeed. Yeah, he just wanted to deliver his monk slap of excommunication. I assume that's what it was. Sounds like a D and D spell or a D and D move. <laughs> monk slap. Psh. No, monk slap of excommunication. Oh, sorry, sorry. The full thing. Yeah. Or maybe he just gets like a Bible thrown at him. Not in the 1300s. Too expensive. Oh, Can't that's true. Can't be throwing books away. Can't just be doing that. More funny though. Like you'll need that in hell. <laughs> it hits Alexander. Just bursts into flames. <laughs> when Alexander was excommunicated, Albany pounced basically. A bit. He started pushing for Euphemia to get a divorce from his brother, not just bring a complaint to the bishops, because it would suit him very well. Well, that'd be just dandy for him, wouldn't it? So by the end of the 1380s, Alexander is losing his marriage. He's facing losing lots of land and power because of this. He's lost many of his titles because his brother has taken them from him. And to make things worse, Bobby died in 1390. Oh no. He was the one protecting Alexander, ultimately. Yes. Big time. So now Alexander doesn't have his dad on the throne to protect him anymore. Ooh. Well, Albany's going to pounce, surely. Well, Bobby died in April of 1390, which made Carrick King Robert III. I forgot Carrick was still about. Mm-hmm. He didn't I thought die. So. No, he didn't die. No. He just had power taken away. Oh. So what's King Carrick going to do? Well, he wasn't really ruling, to be honest. There was a, a pretty big delay in Carrick actually being crowned. There was lots of disputes and lots of debate over who should be king. Lots of fights happening. So it took a while for him to actually be crowned. But he was... But Albany was still in charge. Uh, I wondered if he'd get done to him. What happened to his dad? Yeah, and this upset Alexander big time because Albany was still guardian of Scotland. He still had the power and he was still out for Alexander. Yes, out for blood. Mm -hmm. So you've heard Alexander's position. Yep. You're hearing about all of his problems. Yep. What's his next move? What does he do? There's just been this reshuffle of power. You know what he's going through. What does he do? Now, initial thought was try and murder Albany, but I feel that's too on the nose and he knows he won't get away with it. So I'm thinking he teams up with Carrick and tries to get Carrick reinstated as the like ruler or like he gets the power back 
as opposed to Albany. And then the two of them get Albany into the line. Okay. Okay. That's what I think. Well, bear in mind, Carrick didn't really like Alexander either. I had forgotten that. But then maybe he wants his power. Maybe. So he's willing. Maybe. Alexander wasn't so keen on the teamwork. Okay. Rather than the suggestions you gave, which probably would have made more sense, Alexander decided that he has to do something drastic. Oh no, that's never good. Yeah, he has to make a big show of power, basically to demonstrate his authority and his control. Yep. Even without his father there to protect him, he needs to show that he's a formidable force. Yes. To try and force Albany to realise that he needs to keep Alexander on side. Does he invade some of Albany's land? No. He decides to go for one of Albany's allies in the Highlands. Oh, okay, okay. The Bishop of Murray. Oh, well, he's been excommunicated already, so what's he got to lose, really? Quite a lot, probably, but... (laughs) The Bishop had aligned with Albany before this because he wanted someone to bring Alexander to heel. They'd been having problems for the past 20 or so years, if not longer. Yes. He didn't like Alexander and his power. And there had been the document signed by Alexander to protect the bishop and his lands and his men. Yep. But the bishop but the bishop actually turned to the son of the Earl of Murray for protection instead at this time. Well, that's fair, isn't it? That's mm-hmm. actual protection. So that's how bad things are getting. Yeah. That, that document can't be trusted. Yes, you suddenly realise you're standing behind a piece of paper for protection. You're yeah. like, oh, this isn't going to help, is it? And the son of the Earl of Murray was the Sheriff of Inverness at this time. So he had some authority to try and protect the bishop and everything that they yep. had. However, around May of 1390, so the month after Bobby died, yep. the landowners who were in charge of the bishop's protection left the Highlands and they travelled down to England for some tourney that the King of England was holding. They left. <laughs> okay. Leaving the bishop pretty isolated. Yeah. Should have gone too. Well, I mean, he's the bishop. He, I suppose he is the bishop. His bishoply things to do. Mm-hmm. And this is when Alexander struck. Does he murder the bishop? Oh, I'm about to tell you. So I talked about the bishop of Caithness in the Dunrobin episodes. Yes. And arguably the bishopric of Murray, so this title, was even more influential than the bishop of Caithness. It okay. Was, being the bishop of Murray was a big deal. The seat of the bishopric was in Elgin, where Elgin Cathedral was built. And the seat had been at Spiney before, and the bishops continued to live in and have Spiney Palace, which you can still visit. But the seat of the bishopric was moved to Elgin. Okay, okay. So we talked about it in the Dunrobin episode, they moved the seat from up in Caithness to Dornach. Yes. So it's like the heart of that bishopric. With me? So it's in Elgin. Andreas de Moravia, a relation of the Moravias we talked about, yep. was responsible for Elgin Cathedral being built. And it was a highly revered building, as cathedrals usually are, uh-huh. both for religious reasons and architecturally. It was, I think, the second largest cathedral in Scotland. Very cool. Second to Glasgow Cathedral. Oh. And it was completed around 1242. So it was about 150 years old in 1390. And it was nicknamed the Lantern of the North. It was something that people travelled to come and visit. It was beautiful. It was very, very important to the church. Ooh, okay. In May of 1390, Alexander and his men, his bands of Catarans, descended first on the town of Forest, uh-huh. close to Elgin. And they basically burned the whole town to the ground. That's not so good. They sacked everything. After that, they moved on to Plus Carden Abbey, which was nearby, and they destroyed it. You can't destroy abbeys. And it was rebuilt. You can visit Plus Carden Abbey today. Oh, that's good. Um, it's still used by Benedictine monks. Yeah? Believe it or not. I think it's the only medieval abbey in Scotland still used for its original purpose. Wow. You can go visit. But then Alexander and his men arrived in Elgin in June. And the destruction continued Uh because they set the whole town ablaze. Oh, no. They burned down Greyfriars Monastery. 
they burned down St Giles Church, they burnt down the hospital of Mason Dew, they burnt down the homes of anyone who was linked with the church, they burned them out of their houses, and then they completely destroyed Elgin Cathedral. Well, he was going for a grand gesture, Mm -hmm. and he has certainly managed. Yeah, this was the jewel in the bishop's crown, and Alexander completely destroyed it. I can't see this going over well. Like, because are they just going to be like, okay, sweet, don't mess with him anymore. Let's give him all his power back, obviously. I don't think that's going to happen. This series of events is now known as the Burning of Elgin. That makes sense. And I'm pretty sure Alexander also looted the cathedral before burning it down. Well, that's just sensible. (laughs) So naturally, as you would expect, lots of people were absolutely horrified at what Alexander had done. Yeah, I can't imagine anyone being like, fair play, they were coming after him, so good for him. So he burned two towns down. Yep, that's clearly a good idea. It was just unthinkable, the level of destruction that he had caused and it hadn't really gone how he hoped because it hadn't forced everyone to bow to him Mm -hmm. everyone was just appalled at what he had done yeah i don't really know what he was thinking with that one just anger probably well just intimidation yeah intimidation tactics to get respect it's not it's not gonna work wolfie carrick was a new king but he was forced into pretty swift action against his younger brother <laughs> yeah. because this could not be tolerated. He had struck out against the church. That couldn't happen. No. But Alexander had already been excommunicated. Well, like what, you said. What's left? Well, now it means the church isn't going to punish him. The council and the king are going to punish him. I can see a beheading on the horizon. Is that what you think? Is that what you think would be fair? What do you think they're going to sentence him to? Um, hmm. I I think they'll send him to some sort of stripping of titles, maybe re redivvying his lands, because I think he still has quite a lot of titles left. Yeah, yeah, he does. So they're going to take them off him and divvy them around instead. Well, it's surprisingly unsatisfactory. Oh, really? Mm-hmm. Alexander was ordered to do penance and to pay reparations to the church and to the bishop for what he had destroyed. Is that it? Well, he had to travel down to Blackfriars Church in Perth. I think I have the name of that right. And he had to dress in uh, sackcloth Uh and literally physically grovel at his brother's feet and beg for forgiveness. And the whole council was present. Albany was there. This was the lowest of the low. He had to get down on his knees and he had to grovel to his brother for forgiveness. Yeah, when he was doing it for respect, that is very much the opposite of what he got. He's now pretty much at the lowest of the low. Yeah. But it... uh, To me, it doesn't seem like enough. No, me neither. Because to a point, who cares? But they all care greatly. So, of the time, it probably was a fitting punishment. Well, Carrick, King of Scotland, pardoned Alexander for what he had done. And then he was absolved by the Bishop of St. Andrews for the crimes he had committed against the church. What? Mm -hmm. Wow. Now, I feel if you burn down a cathedral on purpose to get at the church, it should take a bit more to be forgiven for that. Yeah, than a sorry and a fine. Yeah. Ah, well, just give us some money and say you're sorry. Oh, sorry. That's it. I mean, he had to pay, but I don't know how much he actually had to pay. I don't know. Even if it was enough to rebuild the church, like it's, it's, or the cathedral, sorry. Well, I even saw there were documents from the Bishop of Murray pleading with the king for money to rebuild the cathedral. Like, it became a big campaign to the rest of his life to gather money to have the cathedral rebuilt. Yeah. So Alexander didn't pay to have the whole thing put back the way it was. No, he just paid a bit. Well, I mean, he's done pretty well then, really. Well, it doesn't seem like enough, but this really marked the moment when Alexander pretty much entirely retired from public life. Oh, dear. He kind of disappears. 
he was that humiliated. Yeah, his rebellion, it was kind of like a flash in the pan. Yeah. And then he was gone. Unreal. He returned to Badenoch and he wasn't involved in politics or scheming anymore. Hmm. He was just gone. He just existed. Some people don't think he was ever truly sorry for what he had done. Because he was out for revenge. Yeah, why would he have been sorry? Yeah. I don't think he would have. It didn't even come into my mind that he was ever actually sorry. No. So like he had to grovel in things, but it seems like it was worth it. Because he, yeah. got, he got back at the bishop for meddling in his life. Uh-huh. Like, why would he be sorry for getting what he wanted? No. He's probably only sorry that he had to say sorry. Mm-hmm. In 1392, so two years later, Euphemia got her divorce from Alexander. Oh, that's a win. He was out of there. He's out of there. Now, what I thought was a bit strange, and it might not be to other people who know more than I do, but their divorce was granted by anti-pope Clement VII. Anti-pope. The anti-pope. Uh, and it's spelt like anti-pope. Like A-N-T-I. Yeah. Um, have you heard of that before? I have not heard of the anti-pope. Because it turns out it's a thing. I only know the anti-Christ. <laughs> <laughs> different, different. You have the usual pope, the mm-hmm. one that everyone knows about, and the anti-pope was a person who wasn't the Pope, but felt they should be the Pope. Interesting. So they wanted the position of Pope and just kind of did it anyway against the actual Pope. Hmm. So sometimes they had the support of really important people and institutions within the Catholic Church. Yeah. They weren't just on their own, but they weren't the Pope. So they could almost behave as if they were, yeah, but, but they, they weren't. weren't. Well, there you go. That is brand new to me. Kind of like the opposition leader in politics. Yeah. But the anti-pope. The (laughs) anti-pope. Hmm. So that's a thing. I just wanted to tell you. Yeah, that's interesting. Because I had never heard of that before. Nope, that is brand new information. So yeah, that's a thing. That's, so, hmm. So what's next? Their divorce was granted on the grounds that it had been, quote, the cause of wars plundering, arson, murders, and many other damages and scandals. Unquote. I believe it was, so yeah. that's fine. <laughs> so they basically felt that the marriage not existing would be better for everyone. <laughs> Except Alexander, maybe. Well, yeah. Yeah, like, so we don't normally do divorces, but in this case, fair enough, eh? Hmm. Euphemia was given back all the titles and lands that had been subsumed by alexander in their marriage she got everything back which she should have had from the beginning because she didn't need a husband and she definitely didn't need two shitty ones no absolutely not now there was a little bit of confusion and upset over what would happen to the title to the earldom of ross after this divorce yes it's a little complicated because there's layers upon layers and well but remember euphemia had two children with her first husband That's where I assumed it was going. Alexander and Mariotta. So Euphemia's son was heir to the earldom. Yeah. But because Euphemia's marriage to Alexander the Wolf could technically have been been considered to have violated Alexander's previous marriage, and there was evidence that Alexander's father had planned Euphemia's marriage Uh to his son for his own benefit, that made things a bit messy. There was a lot of questions raised and Euphemia's son was worried that a court could rule that he shouldn't inherit and that Alexander should. Yes, that seems likely because these things are stupid. (laughs) Yeah, it doesn't make a whole lot of sense, but there was a lot of concern raised at this Mm -hmm. time. But that didn't happen. Euphemia's son inherited everything when she died and he was all lined up to marry Albany's daughter. Oh, (laughs) took me a minute to catch up there. So they were pretty cosy and it definitely seems like Albany had been advising Euphemia on what she should do. Yes, I feel this is a, that was a long play that has come around for Albany. Because now Alexander doesn't have all of this land. Albany's son is going to have it. Albany's daughter, sorry, his son-in-law 
is going to have it. Oh, what an arsehole. Yep. Damn, he knows how to play the game. Mm-hmm. Very good at playing the game. Yeah. After Alexander's defeat, uh, his sons that he'd had with Myrid actually conducted raids and attacks on his behalf to try and maintain their power in Badenoch. Oh, wow. So remember I said they were raiding. Yep. It didn't work. Yeah. They ended up being imprisoned. And that seems to be a big part of the reason why Alexander was so quiet. Oh. Because his sons weren't at liberty and he didn't want anything to happen to them. So he was trying to protect them by just staying quiet. Yes. And towing the line. Which is a shame because his sons are doing what he did as a son. Yeah. They just didn't get away with it. No. <laughs> In 1402, Alexander had left the Highlands completely. Oh. He was now the bailey for the Earl of Athol. Oh, okay. So his circumstances were much changed. He's Uh now serving someone else on someone else's land. I know. He's not really the big bad wolf anymore. How the mighty hath fallen. Mm -hmm. Big time. And in 1405, Alexander died. Oh. He was... He was born in 1343... And he died in 1405. Uh, 63, I think. So he really wasn't very old. No, not bad for the 1300s. Yeah. So he died in 1405. He was buried in Dunkeld Cathedral in Perthshire. Hmm. One he didn't burn down. Well, he burned down a cathedral and now he's allowed to be buried in a cathedral. Yeah. And how? Who's making these decisions? <laughs> it doesn't make sense. But you can actually go and see his tomb. It's still largely intact in Dunkeld Cathedral. And it has it's one of the tombs that has the effigy of him lying on the oh, top. Yeah. Which is rare to have one in such good condition. Oh, cool. That it survived the Reformation and everything. Um, you can still go visit. Well, obviously, it's not completely intact. Well, 700 years old, that's but fair. you can still go and see it. That's pretty nifty. Has anybody carved a wolf head onto it or something? No. <laughs> no. <laughs> Elgin Cathedral was rebuilt, but after the Reformation happened in 1560, it basically fell into disrepair. Yeah. Um, Efforts were made to try and keep it up, but a storm took down the roof and it it was just left. You can visit the ruins now. Oh, yes. And you can see that it used to be a very grand building, but it's a ruin. Yeah. It's quite a shame that, isn't it? Mm -hmm. For a big, beautiful building. Expensive to maintain for no reason, though. Carrick died in 1406, so the year after Alexander. Okay, yep, yep. And he was King Robert III of Scotland. Yes. So, does Albany become king, or does Carrick have children? The inheritance was tricky. Carrick did have children. He had multiple sons, in fact. The crown was supposed to go to his eldest son, David. Yep. Who was the Duke of Rothsay at the time. But Albany had Rothsay imprisoned in his dungeon in 1402. Oh man, it just comes back around, doesn't and it? And starved him to death. Oh, that's that. Oh, that rings a bell, actually. Mm-hmm. Remember? Yes. Remember, I told you. Yeah, we've we've been here before. Yeah, I told you we'd come back to him. I you told did. you, I'd tell you. I knew it was coming back around because the name, like Albany, we've talked about in Albany. So when David was starved, heir to the throne, was starved to death in a dungeon, Albany then went after David's younger brother, James. Oh, the first king or King James the first, perhaps? Yes. Oh. So Albany didn't manage to get James. James ended up being kidnapped by the English. And it was the news of this that killed Carrick. Ah, oh, oh my God, we've come back around. (laughs) That was a good one, right? That was a good one. So young James eventually became King James I. And we talked about all of this in our Black Dinner episode earlier this season. Yes. (laughs) Yes. Yes, we did. Did I get you? You did get me. That was good. That was good. I enjoyed that immensely. (laughs) During his time as Guardian, Albany actually ended up enlisting one of Alexander's sons, who had been made the Earl of Mar. And he enlisted him to maintain peace in the Highlands oh my. <laughs> after ousting Alexander. And Mar used exactly the same tactics that his father had done. Oh, 
this album he was fiendish. But this time he did it with the royals on side and kept them friendly. So it was allowed this time. Ooh. And he continued to hold this position when James the Throne came on when James the First came onto the throne. Oh man, that is mental. <laughs> so he was doing exactly the same thing, but he was doing it on their terms. Yes. So it was okay. So in a way, Alexander the Wolf had a bit of a raw deal, really. Right. We're going to talk about it. Yeah. Like he, I don't think he was a good person necessarily, but it seems like he was no worse than anybody else. Well, you know, was he the worst of the bunch? Yeah. I don't think so. I don't know. I said at the top that Albany is kind of the worst of the worst. You did. Ooh. He died, Albany died in 1420 after serving as James's regent. Oh. So he had been ruling while James was imprisoned and he was ruling after killing the heir to the throne. Yes. And Albany's son became the next Duke of Albany. But when James returned from exile and Albany was already dead by then, he had Albany's son and most of his entire family, frankly, executed for treason for what they had done to James and his brother. Well, it was not necessarily the rest of his family's fault, but it definitely was treason. Like, I don't know why it took that long for anybody to do something about that, really. And it effectively wiped out the Stuarts of Albany. Crazy. But the Albany we've been talking about was already dead. Yeah. So it was all for naught. Instead of getting the throne, he got his entire family eliminated. But he basically did have the throne. Well, I suppose he himself had the throne, eh? That he had the throne when it should have been his father, and he had the throne when it should have been his brother, and he had the throne when it should have been his nephew. Oh, so while never actually being king, he ruled Scotland for quite a long time. Mm -hmm. Cheeky bastard. And he, he killed a lot of people to get it. Yeah. There are blood on those hands. And he killed his own nephew. Shit. So yeah, Alexander was labelled the Wolf of Badenoch after his death. I'm assuming once his actions had reached more people and people knew who he was. Yep. And the stories kind of became legends. Yeah. And so he was never called this during his lifetime. I actually saw that when he was alive, he was referred to as Great Alexander, the King's son in the North. Wow. In the, the Gallic translation. Gallic society really liked Alexander. Yeah. They liked the way he did things. They admired him. Fair play. So he didn't have that reputation when he was alive. And I read that one of the reasons that the Gallic people liked him so much was his relationship with Myrid. That oh, he yeah. was part of Gallic society. He didn't uh -huh. just try to rule it. And they admired him for it. Oh. So maybe he understood Gallic society better than, you know, the court and everything. Well, that's what we were saying at the beginning. Yeah. Like they were getting offended on behalf of something they didn't understand. But it seems like they liked him. Yeah. Man. And another good point that I read, I didn't come up with this by myself, I'm not that clever. Accounts of Alexander's life were written by later historians uh -huh. um, in the years after. But these historians were all men of the church. Well, they are going to be a bit pissed at someone who got excommunicated and burnt down a cathedral, aren't they? Yeah, so they're not going to write about the good things if there no. were any. I'm not, I'm not saying he was a good person. No. But they're not going to talk about those. I wondered if it was Albany who came up with the nickname and he started spreading that I don't know. he was the wolf of Badenoch. He talked about that happening to the Duke of Cumberland. Yes. In our Culloden episode, his brother started referring to him as the butcher. Uh huh. So it does happen. It does happen. And it would be a good way to for Albany to kind of cement the reputation he was depicting Alexander yeah. as having. So it's tricky. Like You get into the details and the nitty gritty and maybe he wasn't as bad as his reputation says that he is. Oh. Which isn't to say that he's a good person. But no. I would say that his brother was way worse. Yeah, he was the true wolf of the family, I would think. Right? A lot to think about. That's a, that's one to ponder, isn't it? 
I do have one kind of spooky story for you. Oh, yes. On this topic. Now that we've sat through Alexander's sordid history. It's great Alexander, not Alexander the Great. <laughs> <laughs> you have to make that distinction. Yeah. There's a somewhat spooky legend about how Alexander actually died. Oh. Because I didn't tell you where he died. I just told you where he was buried. Yes. The story goes that towards the end of his life, Alexander was either at or was visiting Ruthven Castle. Uh huh. Disgraced, stripped of power. He had nothing left. A stranger appeared at the door of the castle and asked to come inside, away from the night and the rain and all of that. Mm -hmm. He was allowed into the castle and eventually he came to meet Alexander himself in the main banqueting hall of the castle. And this man was very tall, thin, dressed in dark clothes and had a black cloak. The stranger invited Alexander to play chess with him to pass the night. And Alexander agreed. They played through the night, chatting, having a good time, so much of a good time that Alexander barely noticed that every time the stranger called out check and checkmate, the storm raged harder outside. Oh. The next morning, another visitor to the castle arrived, but he was met with a truly strange and dreadful scene because many of Alexander's servants lay dead outside the castle walls. They lay completely lifeless. The only marks on their body seemed to be the marks left by lightning. The visitor ventured further into the castle, trying to discover what on earth had happened there, and he crept into the main banqueting hall. And to his horror, he found Alexander lying on the floor, dead. But there were no marks on his body, no signs of murder or illness, but he was definitely dead. The only strange thing that the visitor found about the way he was lying there was that all the iron nails had been torn out of his boots. Well, that's spooky. All the iron nails torn from his boots? Do you remember who doesn't like iron? Uh, the fairy. The fairy folk don't like iron. That's a lot to ponder. That's a badass way to get killed. Right. Has to be said. I don't know if this is the truth. You know, most ghost stories and folklore stories have holes in them. Uh -huh. One of the theories that explains the existence of the story about how Alexander died is that it was propaganda created by the church after his death. Oh, that, that seems familiar. To kind of put him in league with the devil. Yes. Because the visitor who comes to the castle is kind of synonymous with the devil. Because yeah. there are other stories of the devil playing chess or playing cards. And, you know, the people get what's coming to them. Yeah, absolutely. Well, because it, it sounded like death to me. Mm -hmm. the, the person. Right. <laughs> the but it's creepy. It is creepy. And various people who visit Ruthven Barracks feel a bit weird there don't like it there mm. definitely don't want to go there when it's stormy mm -hmm. well that's a spooky way to go as of today there's a sculpture of alexander which you can go visit in elgin oh yeah it's two meters tall it's a sculpture of alexander and he's standing under a four meter tall arch mm. which is supposed to represent the old cathedral and the statue itself is called the wolf and it was designed by david annand and it actually sits at one end of Alexander Road <laughs> in Elgin. That's strange. Why? Is that a good thing or a bad thing that he's depicted under the arch of the cathedral? I don't know. It's, it's tricky. It's not cut and dry. No, that's peculiar. I also noticed, this is just my own experience, when I was doing my research and just doing a basic Google search for the Wolf of Badenoch to see what I see what comes up, one of the most popular results that it wants to autofill with is descendants of or family tree. And it seems like most people are searching for Alexander because they want to see who he's related to or if they are related to him. I mean, for just a statement... That's up there with like, oh yeah, I'm actually related to Robert the Bruce. I'm actually related to the Wolf of Badenoch. Yes, you should be impressed by me. But that is the story of Alexander Stewart, the Wolf of Badenoch.
Well, I'm, I, oh, I can't make up my mind on him. I was hoping this is where I would leave you at the end. Yes, because, well, I think he's probably a bad guy in some ways. And perhaps even in most ways. But it doesn't seem like he was as bad as you'd expect someone to be who was known as the Wolf of Badenoch. Right? Ooh, oh, it's tricky, isn't it? It's tricky. What do you think? I think overall he was a bad person, but he wasn't the worst person in his family. I think that's fair to say. He did some really bad things and he treated people really badly, but he wasn't the worst. Yeah. But that doesn't forgive what he did. It just means he wasn't the worst. I think that's kind of why it's tricky, because you're, or my brain is arguing, like, for him, to vouch for him. But I'm like, well, why why bother? Because it's just how bad he was. And he was bad regardless. I think he was part of the game. Yeah. And he lost. But he wanted to win. And he would have done whatever it took to win. Yes. So it doesn't make him a good person. It just means he lost. Mm-hmm. He was the loser. If that it makes sense. That does make sense. I think Albany was way worse. Yeah, Albany's the real... He's the snake? Yeah, like dick of the episode. <laughs> he is. Snake in the grass. Highlight for me is managing to get you with that reveal. You did. <laughs> I got... Did anybody else get got? Or did you Did you hear it coming? If you got got, just leave a comment so- somewhere saying, I got got. I got got. <laughs> Team I got got. <laughs> Well, we shall be back for the finale. I know. Last episode of season four. End of the season. I can't believe it's here. It always comes around. Mm -hmm. So quick. It's it's a really good one for next week. Mm -hmm. We're getting spooky for next week because it's the finale. I'm excited. We're doing it. And it was originally going to be today for Halloween, but it's going to be after Halloween. (laughs) Yes. Our two parters pushed it back. Yes. It's going to be truly spooky. It's going to be a really good one. So I really hope that you're here for the finale episode. I do too. And let us know what you think of this episode. Yes. You could leave us a review or a rating somewhere. That would be great. You could recommend us to a friend. You can indeed. You could subscribe to our social media. You could join us on Patreon. It's all there. And if you're listening to this on the Friday it comes out, then you can wish Ailey a happy birthday (laughs) because it's her birthday tomorrow. (laughs) It's just a birthday. It's fine. Can you excited about it? (laughs) (laughs) Thank you for listening. And we shall see you next week. Bye. Bye.